Oh, no. First, play, listen really close. Okay, play it again. Listen really close. See if you recognize this voice. John Wayne. Anybody name the movie? Um, the greatest, story ever told. greatest story ever told. So I wanted to play the video, but my video stuff is not working. So um, Jesus is being crucified. And John Wayne is the person, uh, the Roman soldier, who is standing at the foot of the cross and saying, seeing everything that's going on seeing the heavens changing because this man is on the cross and uh, and then he says oh i was gonna have you play it again but it's it's okay so this morning is the gospel of john wayne but before we get to that remember what what is today what sunday is this <coughs> palm sunday so, Palm Sunday was on what day of the week? Sunday. It was on Sunday. And so, you have Sunday, you have Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We call it Good Friday. Anybody know what every, those same people who were saying, Hosanna, son of David. Uh, do you know what they were saying by Friday? Crucifying. 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 They were screaming out, the same people who were hollering out that this is God's son, have mercy on us, Hosanna in the highest. They switched their tune, and now they don't like what he's doing. They thought he was going to be coming in and overthrowing the Romans and, and setting them free in that way, and they didn't like it. So Matthew 27, verse 22, I'm just going to read it to you. What shall I do then? With Jesus, who is called the Christ, Pilate asked. They all answered, crucify him. There's an exclamation point. They, they mean what they're saying. Why? What crime has he committed? Asked Pilate. And they shouted all the louder. They're screaming and hollering like they're at a football game. Crucify him. Crucify him. Their tune has completely changed. When Jesus came riding into town on the donkey, they're throwing down, they're waving the palm branches, they're throwing them down because they, it's like laying out the red carpet for him. But the Pharisees and Sadducees, in another section of the Bible tells us, they're kind of looking on going, hmm, how can we kill this guy? Because he's coming to take our power and authority, and we don't like him. We don't believe that he's who he said he is, and even if he is, we don't want him here. So, this shows an attitude. And what I'm going to tell you is that attitude is called a settler attitude. So, bear with me. This is, this is kind of a long story. I'm calling it the Gospel of John Wayne because that gets more attention than saying the Western Gospel. Here's John Wayne. And the servant centurion stood in front of Jesus, heard his cry, and saw how he died. He said, surely this man was the Son of God. That's Mark 15, 39. Western theology, or as I like to call it, the Gospel of John Wayne. According to Wes uh, Sealer in his book, Western Theology, there are two kinds of people. Two visions of life. First, sees life as a possession. That's so funny. It's a possession that we're going to have and we're going to hold and we're going to hold on to and we're not going to let anybody else mess with it. Um, to be carefully guarded. They're called settlers. And as Corey Asbury says, he says, if you start hearing these settlers and you go, ooh, I like them settlers. Those guys sound like a good bunch of guys. I'd like to hang around them. He goes, they're the bad guys in the story. Remember that. So those are the settlers. The second group of people, as a, as a life is a wild, fantastic gift. 
They're called pioneers. So these two different groups of people. These two types rise into two kinds of theology. Theology, somebody explained to me that fancy word. What's theo? God. Theo is God. Ology is the study of. So theology is the study of God. They have what you think of as different pairs of glasses. One group sees him like this, and the other one puts their sunglasses on, and they see him this way. So these are our views, our understanding, how we get, like the settlers, the uh, part I have underlined. They attempt to answer all the questions to define and housebreak some supreme being. They're wanting to domesticate Jesus. Julia, can you tell me, because when I read this, I found somebody else telling about, uh, they thought this was so much like uh, C.S. Lewis with Aslan. How is it that they put about Aslan? Is he safe? He's not a tame lion. He, he's good, but he's not safe. Jesus was good. But as he was bringing in his kingdom, it rattled some cages and shook some feathers, and people did not like him because it messed with their theology, the way they looked at things. So they're looking to housebreak this supreme being. Pioneer theology is an attempt to talk about what it means to receive this strange gift of life. The Wild West is the place for both of these theologies. So I'm going to explain the settlers first, then we're going to get to the pioneers, and then we're going to sing, I'm going to sing a couple of songs to you that I don't know if they'll do the same to you that they do to me, but they just move me it's, that's my job as a pastor is to move you into something new into something different <clears throat> the settlers church is a courthouse it's in the center of town life it's an old stone structure that dominates the town square within the courthouse walls you know, where the records are kept taxes are collected the trials are held for the bad guys does that sound anything like some churches, you know? Um, the courthouse is a symbol of law and order, stability, and most importantly, security. We want to be comfortable. That's not necessarily what God called us to. Settler theology, um, the, God is the mayor. So you got the big courthouse, sees everything. You got the mayor sitting in his office. He looks out over the whole town as an eagle eye, ferrets out the smallest details of life. This is how people think of God. That he's just looking for all the things. No one actually sees him or gets close to him. He keeps the, draw, the blinds drawn. But since there is order in the town, who can deny that he's really there? The mayor is predictable and always on schedule. Was Jesus always predictable? Imagine today someone walks in this building and they say they're blind. And I spit in some mud and shove it in their eyes. Canceled. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to get canceled. That's what Jesus did. It made no sense to the people around. But he healed them so it didn't matter whether it made sense or not. The settlers fear the mayor. But look at him to clear the payroll and keep things running. Peace and quiet are the mayor's main concern. He sends out the sheriff to check out if, if any pioneers might be around the town. In settler theology, Jesus is the sheriff. He's the guy who is sent by the mayor to enforce the rules. He always wears the white hat. He drinks milk. Out, draw, out draws the bad guys. The sheriff decides who gets thrown in jail. There is a saying in the town that goes, those who follow the rules and believe in the sheriff is sent by the mayor. They won't stay in Boot Hill when, it, when their time comes. 
So Jesus in this, he's the one who saves us, which is good. And don't get me wrong here. <laughs> we had this discussion yesterday. The Holy Spirit is a spirit. God is a spirit. Um, I, I'm just sidelining here for a second. We live in a world that doesn't understand gender, that doesn't understand sex, male, female. Jesus, we all know from the beard, is a man. When he speaks to the supreme being, what does he call him? He calls him Father. So we know that the Father identifies as a male. It never says anything about the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is a spirit. He's a spirit. So if the other two halves of him are male, I always say he. So in this theology, the Holy Spirit is the saloon, the saloon girl. Bear with me. <clears throat> her job is to comfort the settlers. They come to her when they feel lonely, when life gets dull or dangerous. She tickles them under the chin and makes everything okay again. Think of, think of the saloon girls. And, uh, and think of what people do in the name of the Holy Spirit. They, they get all whipped up in a frenzy and do, do it backflips. And, and it's all about feeling good. Well, I go to church, that church, because they have awesome worship. Because when I go there, I feel all, woo! That's not the point. That's not the Holy Spirit's job. It's a byproduct sometimes of what happens, but that's not his job. He fills you with the energy and the ability to do some work, not to just go, woohoo! And that's the idea of the saloon girl. There, that's what uh, the saloon girls usually made the guys do. Hoot and holler. Um, so the saloon girls also squeal to the sheriff whenever someone starts disturbing the peace. We don't want to disturb the peace. We want everything calm. We want to know what to expect. We don't want a God who is out of the little box. In settler theology, the pastor is the banker. Within his vault are locked the values of the town. He is high, a highly respected man. He has a gun, but he keeps it hidden in his desk. He feels that he and the sheriff have a lot in common. After all, they both protect the bank. How many churches today are all about the money? Uh, that was a picture of the settlers. And you may go, oh, well, I like the peace and quiet. That's nice. And, and everything is in line. I don't know if that's exactly what God... God is a God of order. But he does send us to comfort people who are completely disorderly. Jesus hung out with the people who were completely disorderly. He was hanging out with the prostitutes, with the, with the tax collectors, with the sinners. That's who he was with. So the pioneer theology, the church is the covered wagon. Anybody else like all these little John Wayne pictures? Yeah. Have you been noticing? That's John Wayne driving the... The, the effort is appreciated. <laughs> Took a lot of work, I'm telling you. Um, the covered wagon, it's a house on wheels, always on the move. The covered wagon is where the pioneers eat, sleep, fight, love, live, and die. It bears the marks of life and movement. It creaks, it's uh, scarred with arrows and bandaged with bailing wire. That sounds like something that's going somewhere and doing something. So much of church life is sitting on their blessed assurance. Yep. And that's all it is. I showed up and I should be praised for showing up. That's not the way the church works. 
That may be how the current church works, but that's not how the church works. Just hold on. If I had, if you had seat belts, I'd tell you to put your seat belt on. Um, <laughs> put your helmet on. You may need it. Um, it moves toward the future. Most churches want to look back. They want to look back. Um, they want to be, only some of you will catch this. They're the Uncle Ricos of the world. They want to look back and go, oh man, you remember in high school when I did this? That's not the church. That's not the church. God is waiting to do the next big thing. He's not wanting us to look 200 years in the past, 500 years in the past, 1,000 years in the past. No, he's, he's a God of the past, but he's also the God of right now, and he's the God of the future. Um, it moves towards the future, trying not to get bogged down in old ruts. It's what the church does. This is, that's not how we do that. That's not the way do it. we do it at this church. Um, the old wagon isn't comfortable, but the pioneers don't seem to mind. They are more about adventure than comfort. Pioneer theology. God is the trail boss. Anybody recognize that picture? Yep, the boys, the cowboys. Cowboys. Favorite movie. And he was the trail boss. Um, trail boss, God is the trail boss. He is rough and rugged and full of life. The trail boss lives, eats, sleeps, and fights with his people. Their well-being is his concern. Without him, the wagon wouldn't move. And living free would be impossible. The trail boss will get down in the mud with the, with the pioneers to help push the wagon, which often gets stuck. He prods the pioneers when they get soft and they want to turn back. His fist is the expression of his concern. I don't know about that one, but um, in pioneer theology, Jesus is the scout. Here's Hondo. Um, he rides out ahead of the wagon, finds out which way the pioneer should go. So this is Jesus. Jesus set a path for us. He went out ahead of all of his brothers and sisters and found the right way to go. What's, what's the way? This is the way. And this is the way we're supposed to go. The scout faces all the dangers of the trail and suffers every hardship. He is even attacked by the Indians, though his words and action through his words and actions he reveals the true intention of the trail boss. By following the scout, those on the trail learn what it means to be a true pioneer. This is my favorite. Pioneer theology, the Holy Spirit is the buffalo hunter. Catch the humor. He drives along with the covered wagon. He furnishes fresh meat for the pioneers. He feeds us. Um, they would die without him. The buffalo hunter is a strange character. So this is the Holy Spirit. Sort of a wild man. John the Baptist. Uh, the pioneers never can tell what he'll do next. He scares the heck out of the settlers. <laughs> he has a big black gun that goes off like a cannon. He rides into town on Sunday morning to shake up the settlers. You see, every Sunday morning, the settlers have a nice little ice cream party at the courthouse. With his gun in hand, the buffalo hunter sneaks up to one of the courthouse windows and he fires a tremendous blast that rattles the whole courthouse. Men jump out of their skins, women scream, dogs bark, chuckling to himself. <laughs> the buffalo hunter rides back to the wagon train and shoots up the town as he goes. They, and still today, what Jesus said was true. You don't know where... The Holy Spirit is like a wind. You don't know where it's coming from. You don't know where he's going. You don't know. And, and I can give you stories, but I'm not giving you stories today. We're going through this. 
where the Holy Spirit tells me to do things that I'm like, I don't know. And I do it, and it's like, that's exactly what the person needed. That was exactly the thing. It's just learning his voice. Yes, what he tells you to do sometimes is scary. But if you listen to him, you're a part of bringing heaven to earth for people. In pioneer theology, the pastor is the cook. See the cook? Uh, the pastor is the cook. He doesn't furnish the meat. He just dishes up what the buffalo hunter provides. This is how he supports the movement of the wagon. This is his job. He sees himself as just another pioneer who has le learned to cook. The cook's job is to help the pioneers pioneer. It's the pioneer's job to pioneer, not the cook's. Um, he doesn't confuse his job with the trail boss or the scout or the buffalo hunter. He has his job. He's not God. He's just serving up what what been brought. Pioneer theology, the Christian is a pioneer. They are persons of daring, hungry for new life. They ride hard and know how to use a gun when necessary. The pioneer feels sad for the settlers and tries to tell them of the joy and fulfillment of life on the trail. They die with their boots on. Contrary to what the world tells you, God does not have a retirement plan. Isaiah did not go, it's been fun, but I'm going to sit by the stream and relax for a while. No, they die with their boots on. They go until the Lord takes them home. Courage is being scared to death and saddling up anyway. If, what, if, if your spiritual life has not scared you lately, you're probably not walking with the Lord. You're a settler and you've settled in to a rut. Anybody know what a rut is? <laughs> a rut is, is a grave with both ends open. That's where you'll die. Unless you allow God to move you into something new, once you settle in, you're just settle in, in to die. I'm not ready to die. That doesn't mean I won't die tomorrow. But I want to do whatever God wants me to do while I'm here. Settler theology, the Christian is a settler. He fears the up, open, unknown frontier. Fear holds the church today. I'm scared what someone will think of me. I'm scared what they're going to talk about me. I'm not going to go to another foreign country because in that foreign country, they may kill me for what I believe. And they may kill you for what you believe, but the person in that country that does not know Jesus will die in their sins. And forever be separated from God and heaven. And God expects his church to reach out into the world. And I'm going to tell you some more about that in a minute. Um, so the settler, he fears the open unknown frontier. His concern is to stay on good terms with the mayor and keep out of the sheriff's way. Safety first is his motto. And the courthouse is the symbol of security peace, order, and happiness. He keeps his money in the bank. The banker is his friend. The settler never misses the ice cream party. The settler theology, faith. Faith is trusting in the safety of the town. I know you're going, but that sounds good. Obeying the laws, keeping their nose clean, those are all good things. But if there's people outside of the courthouse and their house is on fire, would you not go out and help them? Not the settler. That would be dangerous. I might do something wrong. 
We, we have a whole generation. I might do it the wrong way. <laughs> yes, you will. You'll do it wrong again and again and again. But eventually, you'll be the one who has found a thousand different ways not to do this thing, and now you know how to do it. That fear controls God's people instead of him. The mayor is up in the courthouse, believing the mayor is up in the courthouse. Pioneer theology, faith is the spirit of adventure. The readiness to move out. The willingness to risk everything on the trail. Faith is obedience to the restless voice of the trail boss. The trail boss speaks when you've gotten comfortable in your little tent and you're ready to settle down for the night and he hollers out, there's danger over here or something spooked the cattle. No, we just, we just want to stay in our little tent and be, and be safe. That's not what God has made us for. In settler theology, salvation lies in living close to home and going to the courthouse. In pioneer theology, salvation is being more afraid of sterile life in the town than death on the trail. Pioneers find joy in the thought of another day to push on to the unknown wilderness. They realize their salvation by trusting the trail boss, following his scout, living on the meat that's provided by the buffalo hunter. Um, they're afraid of sterile uh, town life. To me, this has always struck me, so I'm just going to share this. There's a John Wayne movie, and uh, um, he's talking to this Indian and John says, I'm, I'm going into town and getting a bed for the evening. And the other guy's like, no, I, I, I can't go sleep in a bed. He goes, well, why not? He said, one, it's a little too comfortable. He said, if I get too comfortable, I, wanna, I won't want to go back out. It's where the church is. I'm too comfortable. I don't want to go back out. Settler theology, sin is breaking one of the town's ordinances. Look at uh, true grit there. Um, it's, it's what Jews ended up doing. They had all kinds of laws and ordinances that weren't in the book, but they were expected to live by them. They weren't sent by God. They were sent by men. They were traditions of men. And you had people standing looking at you like he is there. And, okay, I'm going to follow this rule. I'm going to, I don't know why the rule's there. I'm just going to follow the rule because I'm housebroken. Pioneer theology, sin is wanting to turn back. We're going to, I'm going to sing a song in a little bit. And it's going to give you a part of this song. Uh, anybody know, some of you know, the story of the song, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus? Uh, this guy uh, got saved in, in um, England. There was a revival that went through. Him and his family got saved. They decided they were, they were pioneers. They were going to go out and do whatever God wanted them to do. And they went to India, to a dangerous part of India. And he started sharing Jesus with different people in the village. And the, the uh, head person of the town, the chief elder, found out what was going on. And he brought the town together, and he brought the guy and his family. And he said, you're not preaching this anymore. You're done. And, and he says, um, I've decided to follow Jesus. And I want others to follow. And he said, if you continue to preach this, I'm going to kill your sons right now. And so he had two sons and his wife and him. And... 
So they had their arrows and he said, I have decided to follow Jesus. There's no turning back. There's no turning back. And they killed his sons. He said, the chief said, your sons are dead. You can save your wife. You have to stop preaching this in my town. And he said, though none go with me, I still will follow. Sorry. First, he says, the world behind me, the cross before me. So the world behind me, the cross before me. And the chief has his wife killed. And then he says, this is your last chance. Your family is gone. But you can save yourself. And he says, though none go with me, I still will follow. I'm not turning back. And they killed him. And after he was dead, the chief saw what this man had was real. He was willing to die for what he believed was willing to die for what he believed. And, and the chief believed. And then he helped the others to believe. And that's where the song came from. Those people remembered what was said by the missionaries that came to them. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow, no turning back. The pioneer's idea of sin is wanting to turn back. Jesus talks, or the writer of Hebrews talks about the same thing. He says, if you've tasted of the Lord and you turn back, there's no more saving you. You've turned back. You've turned your back on him. The settlers and pioneers portray cowboy movie language. The people of the law and the people of grace and the spirit. In the time of the historical Jesus, the guardians of the ecclesiastical setup were the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. They had hunkered down in the courthouse and enslaved themselves to the law. This not only enhanced their prestige in society, but also gave them a sense of security. And because of it, they chose to kill Jesus. Man fears the responsibility of being free. It is often easier to let others make the decisions for you or to rely on the letter of the law. Some men want to be slaves. There's people in churches all over this world that they're just a slave to, well, this is what my mom and dad did before me, and this is how it works. And I come in every week and I sit here and I hate it and I fall asleep and I sing the songs that I don't like, but this is what make God, makes God happy. That's not the good news. The good news was that a perfect being came down and lived as one of us and gave his life for us. Not so we could stay the same, but so he could come and live within us, the Holy Spirit come and live within us, and change us all to be little Jesuses. That's where the name Christian it started. It was people making fun of the people of the way, and they called them little Christs. They were Christians. But their lives were changed 
And they began to follow Jesus. No turning back. There's nothing that a pioneer wouldn't do. And I, and this, to me, this means a lot. It, it uh, has rattled, it rattled my cage several years ago when I first read it. And it rattled my cage uh, uh, a couple months ago when I heard uh, a song that Corey Asbury wrote. And it's about to come out on an album. The album's not out yet. We're going to play the song. And uh, the reason it rattled my cage is sometimes I'm very much a settler. I'm very much a settler. But the spirit within me reminds me that's not what I'm called to be. I'm not called to settle on things. I need a real relationship with Jesus Christ. I, I can't live on my parents' faith or my grandparents' faith. or And my, my grandmother had faith. She was a great Christian. My parents didn't have too much until later. Um, but our kids, you don't get into heaven on mom and dad's faith. You have to have a relationship with Jesus. And uh, so I tend to settle. And, and God has to rattle my cage. And so we're going to play you a couple of songs that I pray will um, mean as much to you as they have to me. Don't sing along, but the lyrics are there for you. Just take it in. For miles and miles, this treadmill mine, I'm running but I'm not going anywhere. I close the blind. Of this freedom, but it's free. 
free from this fortress, this prison that I've made, my civilized salvation, and my picket fence of faith. This idea we've put this fence around us, we're hunkered down in the, in the courthouse, and we're safe, and we're watched over, and our salvation is taken care of, so now we just wait. That's not. Scripture says, and I'm going to randyize it, I didn't change you for that. That's not why God changed us. He didn't change us so we could sit comfortably by and wait. So the next song is the same idea. This is a song by Rich Mullins. And uh, I don't know if he, had, if he had read the book, but it's the same story. It's the same idea. It's this, these townspeople who have everything nice and safe and quiet. Leave us alone. Well, the dancers took to the promenade. My heart leapt high, and I was unafraid of the feelings I stifled for many years. Saying, How do you, how do you feel? Sometimes I share stuff like this, and then we go, well, what the heck am I supposed to do with all that? Here's a pioneer. Billy Graham. He came to faith because a man many years before heard a sermon and the guy said, all God wants is one man that will do whatever he asks. And that man went out, and his name was D.L. Moody. And he did whatever God asked him to do. And someone got saved at one of his meetings. 
And that man began to go out and preach. And someone got saved in one of his meetings. And some, somebody got saved. And then the same, that person who got saved after several of those things preached that same thing to Billy Graham. And Billy Graham says, I'll do it. He spoke to billions of people. David Brainerd. He gave his life for the American Indian. He wanted to save their souls. And they looked at him and said, before you white people got here, we didn't have to lock our doors. We didn't worry about rape. We didn't worry about all this. Seems to me the problem is you. And then he began to continue to teach them and show them that, yeah, we may be screwed up, but this great spirit you talk about is God. And he rode on horseback. He had uh, tuberculosis. He would be riding and he'd start coughing, snow on the ground, blood looked like there was uh, a murder. There'd be so much blood all over. And he drove himself and drove himself to share that faith. And he died a young man because there's no turning back. Corey Tin Boom lived her life the way she knew she should, which got her in trouble and got her in prison. And she still praised the Lord, even for the lice that were in there. Hudson Taylor gave his life for inland China, began to dress like the Chinese. Instead of coming in in his three-piece suit like everybody did, he became one of them to show them the Jesus that he knew. C.T. Studd left everything behind to change Africa. Watchman Nee gave all of his life. Even though they would throw him in prison for what he believed, he still chose to follow the Lord. Charles Finney preached all these people, William Booth, Samuel Morris, D.L. Moody, John Newton, John Wesley, George Mueller, William Booth, oh, same ones, uh, Gladys Aylward, um, um, guys that uh, got uh, killed by headhunters, uh, crossing the switchblade, he in, uh, went into uh, the city and talked with gang members. And the gang member said, I'll cut you into a million pieces. And David said, and every one of those million pieces will love you. There's no turning back. This man smuggled Bibles into communist Russia. And he just took them in in a VW bug and said, God, you made seeing eyes, you made blind eyes see. Make seeing eyes blind. And he went straight to the machine gun holding soldiers by the gate. And they said, what do you got? Just some books. And they let him in. And he didn't do that once. He did that hundreds of times. They saw the importance of the gift that they held. And they knew it wasn't a gift that they were going to hide in a, in a collection. They were handing it out and giving it out because that gift multiplied, handed out is multiplied, it's not diminished. So all these people did all kinds of different things. And there's something that God has, uh, an ability that God has given you. And you, you may think, well, what can I do with that? God can use it. God can use it. And, and don't give up. So all of these, whether whatever your reading level is, these are comic books. It's just 
Make sure you bring them back. Books. Little kid books. Lots of pictures on each page. Wherever you are, there's someone here that God has made a difference through them. Some of them were hugely intelligent. Um, and some of them, the people made fun of them, D.L. Moody. Uh, they made fun of him because he talked like a hick. And he dressed funny. But pick one up. Read it. Allow it to allow God to speak to you and set a fire that can't be put out. The way, the way I look at it is uh, Terry used to have this uh, pen uh, that she worked when she worked at the hospital. And it said, uh, it's hard to fly with the eagles when you hang out with a bunch of turkeys. And, uh, and, if, and if the strongest Christian you know is me, you're playing on a low field. There's people so much better, so much stronger. And so you may not be able to speak with them one-on-one -on -one the way you can speak with me, but they can speak to you. God can speak to you and show you how he can use you. And, and that can be uh, D.L. Moody shined shoes when he started and shared with people as he shined shoes. That doesn't take a lot of ability. That's just setting the fear behind them and doing what God calls them to do. So, dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray that you would uh, use my silliness to, uh, to help us to draw close to you to the places where we're just worried about our comfort to lay it behind and, and, and be pioneers for you let's just take a minute or two and be quiet think over some of the things that were said some of the things I pointed out allow God to speak to you before they your mind forgets them.